Pterodactylus is a genus of pterosaurs, whose members are popularly known as pterodactyls. It is currently thought to contain only a single species, Pterodactylus antiquus, the first pterosaur species to be named and identified as a flying reptile. The fossil remains of this species have been found primarily in the Solnhofen limestone of Bavaria, Germany, dated to the late Jurassic period, about 150.8 Euro 148.5 million years ago, though more fragmentary remains have been tentatively identified from elsewhere in Europe and in Africa. It was a carnivore and probably preyed upon fish and other small animals. Like all pterosaurs, Pterodactylus had wings formed by a skin and muscle membrane stretching from its elongated fourth finger to its hind limbs. It was supported internally by collagen fibers and externally by keratinous ridges. Description Pterodactylus is known from over 30 fossil specimens, and though most of those are juveniles, many preserve complete skeletons. Pterodactylus antiquus was a relatively small pterosaur with an estimated adult wingspan of about 1.04 meters. Other species were once thought to be smaller. However, these smaller specimens have been shown to represent juveniles of Pterodactylus, as well as its contemporary relatives including Ctenochasma, Germanidactylus, Aerodactylus, Orarasdaco, and Gnophosaurus. The skulls of adult Pterodactylus were long and thin with about 90 narrow, conical teeth. The teeth extended back from the tips of both jaws, and became smaller farther away from the jaw tips. The teeth extended farther back into the jaw than in close relatives, as some were present below the front of the nasont orbital fenestra, the largest opening in the skull. Unlike related species, the skull and jaws were straight, not curved upwards. Pterodactylus, like related pterosaurs, had a crest on its skull composed mainly of soft tissues. In adult Pterodactylus, this crest extended between the back edge of the antorbital fenestra and the back of the skull. In at least one specimen, the crest had a short bony base, also seen in related pterosaurs like Germanidactylus. Solid crests have only been found on large, fully adult specimens of Pterodactylus, indicating that this was a display structure that became larger and more well developed as individuals reached maturity. Bennett noted that other authors claimed that the soft tissue crest of Pterodactylus extended backward behind the skull. Bennett himself, however, didn't find any evidence for the crest extending past the back of the skull. Two specimens of P. antiquus have a low bony crest on their skulls. In BMMS 7 it is 47.5 mm long and has a maximum height of 0.9 mm above the orbit. Paleobiology, year classes, like other pterosaurs, Pterodactylus specimens can vary considerably based on age or level of maturity. Both the proportions of the limb bones, size and shape of the skull, and size and number of teeth changed as the animals grew. Historically, this has led to various growth stages being mistaken for new species of Pterodactylus. Several detailed studies using various methods to measure growth curves among known specimens have suggested that there is actually only one valid Pterodactylus species. P. antiquus. The youngest immature Pterodactylus antiquus specimens have a small number of teeth, and the teeth have a relatively broad base. The teeth of other P. antiquus specimens are both narrower and more numerous. Pterodactylus specimens can be divided into two distinct year classes. In the first year class, the skulls are only 15 to 45 mm in length. The second year class is characterized by skulls 55 to 95 mm long, but still immature. These first two size groups were once classified as juveniles and adults of the species P. quachi, until further study showed that even the supposed adults were immature, and possibly belonged to a distinct genus. A third year class is represented by specimens of the traditional P. antiquus, as well as a few isolated, Large specimens once assigned to P. quachi that overlap P. antiquus in size. However, all specimens in this third year class also show sign of immaturity. Fully mature pterodactylus specimens remain unknown, or may have been mistakenly classified as a different genus. Growth and breeding seasons The distinct year classes of pterodactylus antiquus specimens show that this species, like the contemporary Rumphorhynchus moonsteri, 
likely bred seasonally and grew consistently during its lifetime. A new generation of first-year class P. antiquus would have been produced seasonally, and reached second-year size by the time the next generation hatched, creating distinct clumps of similarly sized and aged individuals in the fossil record. The smallest size class probably consisted of individuals that had just begun to fly and were less than one year old. The second year class represents individuals one to two years old, and the rare third year class is composed of specimens over two years old. This growth pattern is similar to modern crocodilians, rather than the rapid growth of modern birds. Daily activity patterns Comparisons between the squirrel rings of Pterodactylus antiquus and modern birds and reptiles suggest that it may have been diurnal. This may also indicate niche partitioning with contemporary pterosaurs inferred to be nocturnal, such as Ctenochasma and round four hinges. History The type specimen of the animal now known as Pterodactylus antiquus was one of the first pterosaur fossils ever to be identified. The first pterodactylus specimen was described by the Italian scientist Cosimo Alessandro Collini in 1784, based on a fossil skeleton that had been unearthed from the Solnhofen limestone of Bavaria. Collini was the curator of the Naturalin Cabinet, or Nature Cabinet, in the palace of Charles Theodore, Elector of Bavaria at Mannheim. The specimen had been given to the collection by Count Friedrich Ferdinand zu Pappenheim, probably around 1780 having been recovered from a lithographic limestone quarry in H. de Currency TT. The actual date of the specimen's discovery and entry into the collection is unknown. It was not mentioned in a catalogue of the collection taken in 1767 and so must have been acquired at some point between that date and its 1784 description by Collini. This makes it potentially the earliest documented pterosaur find. The Pester exemplar of Pterodactylus micronix was described in 1779 and possibly discovered earlier than the Mannheim specimen, but it was at first considered to be a fossil crustacean. Collini, in his first description of the Mannheim specimen, did not conclude that it was a flying animal. In fact, Collini could not fathom what kind of animal it might have been, rejecting affinities with the birds or the bats. He speculated that it may have been a sea creature not for any anatomical reason, but because he thought the ocean depths were more likely to have housed unknown types of animals. The idea that pterosaurs were aquatic animals persisted among a minority of scientists as late as 1830, when the German zoologist Johann Georg Wogler published a text on amphibians, which included an illustration of pterodactylus using its wings as flippers. Wogler went so far as to classify pterodactylus, along with other aquatic vertebrates, in the class Griffey, between birds and mammals. It was the German-French scientist Johann Hermann who first stated that Pterodactylus used its long fourth finger to support a wing membrane. In March 1800, Hermann alerted the French scientist Georges Cuvier to the existence of Collini's fossil, believing that it had been captured by the occupying armies of Napoleon and sent to the French collections in Paris as war booty. At the time special French political commissars systematically seized art treasures and objects of scientific interest. Hermann sent Cuvier a letter containing his own interpretation of the specimen, which he believed to be a mammal, including the first known life restoration of a pterosaur. Hermann restored the animal with wing membranes extending from the long fourth finger to the ankle and a covering of fur. Hermann also added a membrane between the neck and wrist, as is the condition in bats. Cuvier agreed with this interpretation, and at Hermann's suggestion, Cuvier became the first to publish these ideas in December 1800 in a very short description. Cuvier remarked, It is not possible to doubt that the long finger served to support a membrane that, by lengthening the anterior extremity of this animal, formed a good wing. However, contrary to Hermann, Cuvier was convinced the animal was a reptile. The specimen had not in fact been seized by the French. Rather, in 1802, following the death of Charles Theodore, it was brought to Munich, where Baron Johann Paul Karl von Moll had obtained a general exemption of confiscation for the Bavarian collections. Cuvier asked von Moll to study the fossil but was informed it could not be found. In 1809 Cuvier published a somewhat longer description, in which he named the animal a pterodactyl, 
and refuted a hypothesis by Johann Friedrich Blumenbach that it would have been a shorebird. Contrary to von Moll's report, the fossil was not missing. It was being studied by Samuel Thomas von Zahr Paragraph Mering, who gave a public lecture about it on December 27, 1810. In January 1811, von Zahr Paragraph Mering wrote a letter to Cuvier deploring the fact that he had only recently been informed of Cuvier's request for information. His lecture was published in 1812, and in it von Zahr Paragraph Mering named the species Ornithocephalus antiquus. The animal was described as being both a mammal, a bat, and a foreman between mammals and birds, that is not intermediate in descent but in affinity, or archetype. Cuvier disagreed, and the same year in his Assemens fossils provided a lengthy description in which he restated that the animal was a reptile. It was not until 1817 that a second specimen of Pterodactylus came to light, again from Solnhofen. This tiny specimen was that year described by von Sowemering as Ornithocephalus bravirostris, named for its short snout, now understood to be a juvenile character. He provided a restoration of the skeleton, the first one published for any pterosaur. This restoration was very inaccurate, von Sowemering mistaking the long metacarpals for the bones of the lower arm, the lower arm for the humerus, this upper arm for the breastbone and this sternum again for the shoulder blades. So Emering did not change his opinion that these forms were bats and this bat model for interpreting pterosaurs would remain influential long after a consensus had been reached around 1860 that they were reptiles. The standard assumptions were that pterosaurs were quadrupedal, clumsy on the ground, furred, warm-blooded and had a wing membrane reaching the ankle. Some of these elements have been confirmed, some refuted by modern research, while others remain disputed. Classification. The genus now known as Pterodactylus was originally named Petrodactyl by Cuvier in 1809, though this was a typographical error, later corrected by him to ptar copyright Rodactyl. In 1812, Samuel Thomas von Zahr Paragraph Mering named the same specimen Ornithocephalus antiquus. The genus name was amended to the current Pterodactylus by Constantine Samuel Raffinesque in 1815. Unaware of Raffinesque's publication, Cuvier himself in 1819 again amended the genus name, but the specific name he then gave, Longerostris, has to give precedence to von Sowemering's Antiquus. In 1888 Richard Lidecker designated Pterodactylus Antiquus the type species. The original specimen is the holotype of the genus, BSP No. ASI. 739. Hermann von Mayer, in 1830, used the name pterodactylite to contain pterodactylus and other pterosaurs known at the time. This was amended to the family Pterodactylidae by Prince Charles Lucien Bonaparte in 1838. This family has more recently been used to refer to many similar species from Germany and elsewhere, though recent studies suggest it may be a paraphyletic or polyphyletic unnatural grouping with respect to more advanced members of the Ctenochasmatoidae. Below is a cladogram showing the results of a phylogenetic analysis presented by Andres, Clark and Zhu, 2014. Species Numerous species have been assigned to Pterodactylus in the years since its discovery. In the first half of the 19th century any new pterosaur species would be named Pterodactylus, which thus became a typical wastebasket taxon. Even after clearly different forms had later been given their own generic name, New species would be created from the very productive late Jurassic German sites, often based on only slightly different material. Around 1980, subsequent revisions by Peter Wellenhofer had reduced the number of recognized species to about half a dozen. Many species assigned to Pterodactylus had been based on juvenile specimens, and subsequently been recognized as immature individuals of other species or genera. By the 1990s it was understood that this was even true for part of the remaining species. P. elegans, for example, was found by numerous studies to be an immature Ctenochasma. Another species of Pterodactylus originally based on small, immature specimens was P. micronix. However, it has been difficult to determine exactly of what genus and species P. micronix might be the juvenile form. Star copyright Fane Juve 
Christopher Bennett and others had once suggested that it probably belonged either to Cnophosaurus subulatus or one of the Ctenochasma species, though after additional research Bennett assigned it to the genus Aurorazhdarko. Another species with a complex history is P. longicolum, named by von Mayer in 1854, based on a large specimen with a long neck and fewer teeth. Many researchers, including David Unwin, have found P. longicolum to be distinct from P. quachi and P. antiquus. Unwin found P. longicolum to be closer to Germanidactylus and therefore requiring a new genus name. It has sometimes been placed in the genus Diapocephalus because Harry Govia Seeley based this genus partly on the P. longicolum material. However, it was shown by Bennett that the type specimen later designated for Diapocephalus was a fossil belonging to P. quachi, and no longer thought to be separate from Pterodactylus. Diapocephalus is therefore a synonym of Pterodactylus, and as such is unavailable for use as a new genus for P. longicolum. P. Longicolum was eventually made the type species of a separate genus Ardedactylus. In 2014, P. scolopisiceps, formerly regarded as a junior synonym, was moved to its own genus, Aerodactylus. The only well-known and well-supported species left by the first decades of the 21st century were P. antiquus and P. quachi. However, most studies between 1995 and 2010 found little reason to separate even these two species and treated them as synonymous. In 1996, Bennett suggested that the differences between specimens of P. quachi and P. antiquus could be explained by differences in age. In a 2004 paper, Juve used a different method of analysis and recovered the same result, showing that the distinctive features of P. quachi were age-related, and using mathematical comparison to show that the two forms are different growth stages of the same species. An additional review of the specimens published in 2013 demonstrated that some of the supposed differences between P. quachi and P. antiquus were due to measurement errors, further supporting their synonymy. However, in 2014 Stephen Vyduvik and David Martil concluded that the differences between P. quachi and P. antiquus, including the shorter neck vertebrae of P. quachi, were significant enough to separate them. Vyduvik and Martil also performed a phylogenetic analysis which treated all relevant specimens as distinct units, and found the P. quachi type specimen did not form a clade with that of P. antiquus. They concluded that the genus Diapocephalus could be returned to use to distinguish P. quachi from P. antiquus, and further suggested that Germanidactylus ramphistinus was probably the adult form of P. quachi, due in part to its short neck vertebrae and much larger size. List of species and synonyms During its over 200 year history, the various species of Pterodactylus have gone through a number of changes in classification, and thus have acquired a large number of synonyms. Additionally, a number of species assigned to Pterodactylus are based on poor remains that have proven difficult to assign to one species or another, and are therefore considered nomina dubia. The following list includes names that are based on German material presently, or until recently thought to be pertaining to Pterodactylus proper and names based on other material that has as yet not been assigned to other genera. References